Well, my Winder cousins, I am so happy to see all of you uh, as we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the birth of our wonderful ancestor, John R. Winder, which actually took place yesterday. Uh, a boy born in obscurity in Biddenden, England, in 1821, who joined the church, came to the United States, uh, was the father of a great family, and was a very successful person and a, a successful member of the church. We would like to begin our meeting by singing the pioneer hymn, They the Builders of the Nation, hymn number 36. The chorister for this will be Amy Winder Newton. Uh, she'll be accompanied by Nicholas Winder Bassett. And then the opening prayer will be given by Susan Winder Tanner. Those of us from the William C. Winder family, our great-grandmother Rose Winder was a first cousin of the author of this song, so it means a little extra to us. Anyway, we'll uh, turn it then to you, Amy and Nicholas. Our dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunity to gather today in honor of our wonderful ancestor, John R. Winder. We are grateful for the magnificent life of service that he gave to the church and for his exemplary life. We are thankful to remember him and learn more about him in this meeting, and we pray for thy spirit, that we will feel of his goodness and uh, emulate that goodness in our lives. We are grateful for those who have planned and prepared this evening for us and grateful to be assembled together as loved ones and relatives. And pray for thy spirit now, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
uh, as I visited with people, it's interesting how many branches of the family are uh, represented tonight. So we thought we'd take a moment and go through uh, a roll call of the descendants. John R. Winder had children with three wives. And then in his uh, uh, older years, he was married to a very fun and attractive young woman uh, who gave him a lot of... Uh, a lot of pleasant experiences, and the family was absolutely crazy about her. That was Aunt Rye. But uh, his first wife was Ellen Walters that he married in England. And uh, the family of Ellen Walters uh, uh, has been here in Salt Lake. We've seen less of them, sadly, but we do have some descendants here with us tonight. But anyway, this is a picture of Ellen. She had uh, ten children. Uh, one of the daughters, she had twins, Mary and Martha, how appropriate. Uh, uh, Martha Walters Winder, uh, who married Newell Kimball, who was a son of uh, Heber C. Kimball. That family was in Logan. Uh, her twin sister, Mary... Uh, wait, wait, go back to Martha. I know there are no descendants <laughs> of Martha Kimball. Are we surprised tonight? In all my life, we have never had a descendant of Martha Kimball, sadly, at one of our activities. But anyway, they are out there somewhere, but they are in disguise. Uh, Mary Carrington was uh, Martha's twin sister. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think we have any members of the Carrington family. Am I wrong here tonight? Okay. Uh, a daughter of John R. Winder, who died very young, uh, up in uh, Rich County, up where it was freezing cold, uh, Elizabeth or Lizzie Walters Winder Eldridge. Are there any Eldridge descendants here with us tonight? We have we have known some of them, so uh, we've we've had them through the years. Uh, Eliza Winder Midgley, uh, another daughter of uh, John R. Winder and Ellen Walters. Do we have anyone from the Midgley family with us? Uh, Susan uh, Winder Williams, and uh, we have some of her descendants with us tonight, if they would stand. Look at that. And we can applaud in this chapel. Church is over. So stand up again. That's great. This is a, a descendant of Susan uh, uh, Winder Williams. And I believe you are the only uh, one of our Walters descendants who's here tonight, so that makes you very special. So we're glad you could be with us. Um, Ellen also had uh, children that uh, either died uh, too young to have children or, uh, for example, Uncle John Rex Winder, who uh, uh, was uh, unmarried at the time of his death but uh, well-remembered by members of the family because he lived a, a fairly long life. Uh, John R. was married for a time to uh, Hannah Thompson. Uh, sadly, the marriage was not a success, but she bore a daughter. Uh, the daughter was Anna Winder Miller. Do we have any descendants of the Miller family here with us tonight? Uh, Anna went on to marry uh, Uriah Brower, and they lived in uh, Tooele Valley. Uh, most of John R. Winder's descendants who are here are descended from uh, Elizabeth Parker Winder, and uh, she was John R. Winder's third wife. Uh, she and the second wife, Hannah, were very close friends for the duration of Hannah's time in the family. Uh, Elizabeth Parker Winder was the mother of 10 children. And uh, the oldest one was uh, William Charles Parker Winder, who happened to be my great-grandfather. And uh, everybody who's descended from uh, William C. Winder, would you please stand? Very glad to have you all, cousins. Uh, William C. was the one who uh, worked on the dairy with his father. John R. Winder formed Winder Dairy, as you know, in 1880. It was pretty well taken over by William C. Winder and his kid brother, Uncle Rex Winder, who was a family favorite. 
the oldest daughter was uh, Ellen, or excuse me, Alice Winter Bradford. And uh, the Bradfords are a very fine family. Do we have any Bradford descendants here tonight? Okay. Uh, Richard Henry Winder uh, lived in the Uinta Basin uh, for some time. Uh, do we have any descendants of Uncle Richard Winder? And then uh, Mary Ann Parker Winder, or Aunt Min Stedman, and uh, she lived out in Riverton. Do we have any descendants of the Stedmans with us? Oh, look at that, a whole row. All right, that's uh, worth applause. My great-grandfather loved his sister, Minnie, and uh, they had a good time out there. Uh, Uncle Ed Winder, Edwin Joseph Winder, uh, moved to uh, Vernal. And I know we've got a number of Uncle Ed's descendants here. Would they please stand? Look at that. You're going to wipe out the William C. Winders one of these days. Terrific. We are delighted to have you. Uh, the next child was Aunt Lou, Florence Luella Winder, and she was married to uh, uh, James Giles. Anyone from the uh, Giles family with us? Uh, Aunt Till, Matilda Edna Winder Hamilton. I know we have descendants from Aunt Till Hamilton tonight. Would they stand? Well, very good. Uh, Ella Mae Winder Mackey. We love our Mackeys, and uh, we've got these Mackeys on my mother's side, and uh, on my father's side, we've got two branches of Mackey families, so we cannot get enough. Any descendants from uh, Aunt uh, Ella Winder Mackey? Very good. And then the youngest daughter, Gertrude Winder, married Mark Croxell. He was a uh, adopted son of uh, George Q. Cannon. Half the time they were Croxells, half the time they were Cannons. I don't think we've got any of the Croxell hyphen Cannons with us. Uh, anybody from that family? Very good. And then the, the baby of the family, who was the favorite. I remember Uncle Rex. I remember him being at the Winder reunion at the dairy in 1967. And he would have been 88, but I thought he was older than Methuselah. And I, I, I recognize the history. I remember looking at him thinking, that's John R. Winder's son. So do we have any descendants of Uncle Rex? Our branch of the family called him Unc. Anyway, he was greatly beloved, and he worked with William C. in the dairy. So anyway, uh, thank you. We're delighted that all of you would be with us. What a great family this is. The John R. Winder family always celebrated Grandpa Winder's birthday out at Poplar Farm. John R. died in 1910, and then it was decided two years later in 1912 that the family would form a family organization to commemorate John R. Winder's birthday. So every December from 1912 to uh, probably 1974, uh, a party was held in December in connection with John R. Winder's birthday for all of his descendants. Then in 74, somebody finally said, enough, this is too close to Christmas. So it was moved to January, and then people got tired of slipping and sliding on the roads. So it was held every year then uh, in uh, May or, uh, or April. And uh, we continued with those John R. Winder family organization reunions until 2006. So I think we did pretty well. We almost made it 100 years. So anyway, I, uh, I'm uh, grateful to be a descendant of John R. Winder. I was always interested in his life. I was interested in the life of his children. And uh, I knew many of his grandchildren, all of whom are gone, but uh, an outstanding family an unbelievably cheerful and uh, happy-natured family, I would have to say. So I'd like to turn the time now uh, to our cousin, Mike Winder. No. Pardon me. Chris. Oh, excuse me, Chris. She was praying I would forget this, but she's not getting off the hook. Uh, 
our, my second cousin, Chris Wynn Matthews, has uh, memorized a poem. Uh, she'll be reciting a poem that Elder Orson F. Whitney composed for John R. Winder's 82nd birthday celebration, which took place in 1903. She is a brilliant girl. She knew all the words to that song. She memorizes everything she gets her hands on. So I'm interested to hear this poem that Chris is going to recite for us. Following that, we'll turn the time to Mike. And he's got a, a wonderful presentation. Mike's really our historian on uh, Grandfather John R. Winder. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, when Mike has finished, he's going to lead us in a uh, rendition of Happy Birthday. I don't know if the Winders sing, but we'll give it a go if we do Happy Birthday. In our family, we don't even try it. Um, and nobody enjoys off-key singing in my own family. Uh, let's see, then we'll have a, uh, a closing prayer given by uh, John R. Winder, a fourth grade grandson. I'm glad to be able to share this with you tonight. The language is kind of stilted, but I think there's a message here that's of value to us. There's a name writ large, a name writ oft in the book of human life. What name than this, more in glory's charge or more with merit rife? John the Beloved, was the name he bore, who wrote as the Spirit spake, and John that other who went before and bled for the Master's sake. There's the name of Wycliffe, the Morning Star, of Calvin and Knox and Huss, of Milton Divine, whose fame from afar has descended unto us. The name of many a sapient sage in science, letters, and art, warriors and statesmen in any age, giants in mind and in heart. Till chosen of God and honored of man, that radiant name appears, still shining down from the snowy van of two and eighty years, a pillar, silvering the brow of a son of God, a man of war and of peace who fought for the right, then plowed and sowed and hath reaped the rich increase. A pillar he in God's temple now, no more to go out for a. And to him the gathered hundreds bow on this grand natal day. Next to the prophet, the chief in charge, victor in peace as in strife, John Rex Winder, a name writ large in the Lamb's great book of life. And I've added two little stanzas to mark this occasion. And we're gathered here on this blessed day to honor great grandpa's birth. May we build pure lives and follow his steps as we live upon the earth. And may we forever find our way determined and wise as he. So we carry on with a humble and good that is his grand legacy. That, that was amazing, Chris. Thank you. That's the first time in 118 years that that poem has been publicly presented. And to be presented by memory is something both John R. and even Orson F. Whitney, who wrote it, would be pleased with. Well done, Chris. Thank you. The, uh, just a couple housekeeping items. One is, as you saw, we have plenty of treats to be had. And thank you, all those who, who brought treats. Uh, we also have plenty of books still left. Uh, Karen and I have thought they've been in my tough shed long enough after 25 years or 22 years, whatever it's been. And so I'm hoping to not go home with any tonight. So free of charge, John R.'s birthday gift to all of you indirectly. So feel free to take one of those. And I have some old Winder Dairy pencil of my dad, Kent Winder, too, that he sent up from St. George. So feel free to grab a pencil as well. Um, also, after the, the rousing rendition of Happy Birthday and the closing, son by, the closing prayer by my son, John R. Winder, 
Um, we will then please stay for just a moment for a group picture. My good friend Mike Gates is uh, videoing tonight's proceedings, and he, he's going to come up and take a group picture of all of you, all of us. Uh, that'll be fun. And then also, uh, if you haven't signed up at the name tag table with your email address, please do, because in a week or two or three, whenever Mike edits this presentation and, and reunion, I'll send the YouTube link out to everybody. And you can spread it far and wide for if you can't get to sleep one night, you can have this. But you may have relatives that didn't get one, too. Um, the, John R. Winder's successors as counselors in the first presidency wanted to be here today, but they could not. Uh, President Dallin H. Oaks is rededicating the Mesa, Arizona temple today and sent me an email and asked me to convey to the family, uh, please give my greetings, esteem, and affection to the members of your family who assemble for this significant event. I'm very appreciative that you would invite me to be with the Winder family, whom I've always held in such esteem. And President Eyring of the First Presidency sent this letter. Dear Brother Winder, thank you for the kind invitation to attend the bicentennial celebration of John R. Winder. I will not be able to attend this event, but wish you well in this endeavor for the Winder family. I have read some of the history, notably that written by you. You are all truly blessed to be a descendant of John. His work within the church and with community, state, and military will not be forgotten. I have been acquainted with many members of the Winder family, and have found myself admiring their love for the Savior, his gospel, and for his church. I pray that we will all follow that example to love the Lord with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. May all the members of your family enjoy their time together at this special event. Sincerely, Henry B. Eyring. So, so much love. It's, this is a family celebration, but it's kind of a church celebration, too, for the 200th anniversary of President Winder. Let's see, just so we can see the colorized photos better, we're going to have... Uh, President Blake Dalton, who's helping with our stuff today, dim the lights. There you go. Well, it's appropriate that we have this birthday party. For each year, for the last dozen years of his life, John R. Winder enjoyed his birthday parties in his favorite building, the Salt Lake Temple, as you can see in this invite. Sometimes the guests wore buttons, like this one for his 83rd. In fact, I'm wearing that very button today, if anyone wants to see it after. Sometimes they had photos of the guest of honor to autograph for them, like this one from his 85th. And once there was even a poem written in his honor, like Chris just reminded us. But to truly understand John Rex Winder, we must go back to jolly old England. For over 1,000 years, the Winder families had lived in the southeast corner of England in the counties of Sussex and Kent. In the village of Biddenden, Richard and Sophia Winder were the parents of five sons and five daughters. One of their sons, named John Rex Winder, died in 1819 at the age of four. When their next child was born, December 11, 1821, they named him after his deceased elder brother. And of course, there's been many John Winders since. At one of his birthday parties in the temple, John R. shared a story from when he was six years old as a boy in Biddenden. I was sent out into the fields to keep the birds off the grain, and it was a very lonely spot, surrounded with woods. Being entirely alone, I was somewhat fearful, and I remember that I was impressed to kneel down in the brush and, brush and pray to the Lord that his angels might watch over and protect me from harm. I remember now, just as well as I see your faces, that that was the end of my fear. I also think that that was the beginning of my success in life. Although that spot is many thousand miles distant, and is more than 70 years ago, I could walk straight to that very spot where I knelt down and where I received that blessing. At the age of 20, young John R. struck out on his own in bustling Victorian London. He got a job at the West End Shoe and Grocery Store, where he learned to be a shoe and leather man. In London, John fell in love with an attractive shop girl, Ellen Walters, and they married in 1845. Their first child was a little girl named Ellen Sophia Winder, who died unexpectedly as a 14-month-old. Not long after this tragedy, a Mr. Collinson recruited John to manage his boot and shoe store in Liverpool. John R. later recalled, I was in the store one day, and a person had torn up a letter into very small fragments and thrown it on the floor. I was impressed to pick up a small piece of it, and on that piece of paper were the two words, Latter-day Saint. I looked at it and wondered what it meant. 
I asked the man who was at the desk what it meant. He happened to be a Latter-day Saint and told me what it meant and where the people were meeting in Liverpool. And it was here at the old music hall on Bold Street. I went to their meeting, creeping up a back stairs and peeping through the banisters to get a glimpse of the inside. The congregation was addressed by Elder Orson Spencer of Salt Lake City. I thought he must know that I was there, for every word fitted my case and seemed meant especially for me. After hearing the sermon, John was convinced of the truth and desired baptism. Ellen was soon baptized as well. Brother Winder actively served in his branch as a local missionary and as secretary in the Liverpool Conference. But the Winder family, like many British saints of the day, desired to gather to Zion and join the main body of the church in the Valley of the Great Salt Lake. The inheritance Ellen acquired from the death of her father provided the means for the young family to fulfill this dream. In a cold February 1853, they set sail from Liverpool across the stormy Atlantic. Accompanying them on their journey to America was their four-year-old son, John R. Jr., twin baby daughters, Mary and Martha, and a young Irish girl who they practically adopted who they brought along to help with the kids. On this tumultuous voyage, John R. only narrowly escaped a watery grave. He said, It was discovered that smallpox was on board. I was the, among five who came down with the disease and had to be quarantined in a little house built on deck for that purpose. This was a trying time both to me and my wife, who was left without my assistance to care for her twin babies, which was no small task on shipboard. To add to our anxiety, one of the patients lying next to me died, and soon the sailors came and took the body and cast it into the sea. I heard them say, we will have him next, meaning me, but I had faith that I would recover and get to Zion, and in due time my faith was confirmed. The family arrived in New Orleans, and then they took a steamship up the Mississippi River to Keokuk, Iowa, where the pioneers were outfitting that year. And John R. served as captain of 50 on the overland trek, helping his flock navigate dust storms, quicksand, mountain passes, and Indian encounters, finally making it to the valley in October 10, 1853. And this is what the valley looked like at the time. About 5,000 people. The Salt Lake Temple had just started earlier that year, and hadn't risen very far, obviously. And it was quite a far cry from the civilization in England they'd enjoyed. Here's John and Mary and Martha. Being an experienced shoe and leather man, John R. said, I engaged soon after my arrival in the manufacture of saddles, boots, and shoes, and in the conduct of a tannery. He was involved with several tanneries early on, and his business partners included future mayors of Salt Lake City and President Brigham Young. The tanneries all were quite prosperous and generated a hefty return for their partners. He was a very in industrious man, George Winder once told me of his grandfather, and extremely thrifty and a smart investor. Faithful men in Pioneer, Utah, were encouraged, if they had the means, to take additional wives. With Ellen's consent, John courted Scottish immigrant Hannah Thompson, whom he married in 1855. Two years later, English immigrant Elizabeth Parker became his third wife. John built a beautiful new home on 3rd South, just west of Main Street, for his growing family. John R. joined the territorial militia, which was called the Nauvoo Legion, even though they weren't in Nauvoo anymore. And when Johnston's, arm, Johnston's army was sent to invade Utah in 1857, Captain Winder joined in the guerrilla warfare that ground the advancing U.S. troops to a halt on the high plains of Wyoming. He was then given the important assignment of guarding Echo Canyon throughout the winter to keep the army out, sometimes with only a few troops at his disposal. This often required some tremendous creativity. Captain Winder seemed especially fearful that the enemy would realize how few men actually guarded the canyon. One night, when they were being watched from a distance, Winder ordered the small detachment to march around and around the huge bonfires. With their shadows cast up on the steep canyon walls and a seemingly continuous stream of soldiers appearing, an illusion was made that there were many more soldiers in the canyon than there actually were. Army scouts reported to their leaders that thousands of Mormon soldiers must be guarding Echo Canyon. This report, combined with the deep snows that soon fell, caused the army to remain in place throughout the winter until peace was negotiated. Captain Winder later became Lieutenant Colonel Winder and even Adjutant General Winder during the Black Hawk Indian War. He was also a bodyguard and traveling companion to President Brigham Young. He served Salt Lake City as a city councilman, assessor and collector, and city watermaster. 
On one occasion, a poor but worthy widow saved up her money to pay her taxes, but to her surprise, she did not receive her tax notice. After inquiring about the missing notice, she discovered that her taxes had been paid already. This was while Brother Winder was assessor and collector, it was remembered, and instead of sending the poor widow her notice, he paid the taxes himself. He served as a delegate to several of the state constitutional conventions and rejoiced when the Beehive State was finally admitted to the Union. He built a new city home for first wife Ellen in the late 1870s. It was on 62 South, 3rd East. She uh, was a great contributor to the community there and died in 1892. As for his second wife, as Harlan mentioned, a misunderstanding led to deep divisions between John R. and Hannah. They divorced in 1864, and she went on to remarry. John R. regretted his mishandling of the situation the rest of his life. He built a new country home for his third wife, Elizabeth, calling it Poplar Farm because of the poplar trees in 1865. This picture was taken in 1880, the year the dairy started. And this was at 2700 South and 3rd East in what is now South Salt Lake. Tragically, Elizabeth died on Christmas Day, 1883, of muscular dystrophy at the young age of 46. She had her husband and her 10 children, ages 4 through 25, at her bedside when she passed. And Christmases were all, was a little sadder for the Winders after that. With John R. dividing time between the city Winders downtown and the country Winders at Poplar Farm, Elizabeth's children largely raised each other. Poplar Farm was expanded around 1890 and had a huge kitchen and a gorgeous ballroom, perfect for hosting the numerous dances and socials. Now that he had a country estate, John R. began to accumulate a herd of prize-winning, pure-blooded Jersey cows. Poplar Farm had a deep well where the fresh milk could be kept especially cold and fresh. In April 1880, the Winder Dairy started with some of the downtown hotels as their first customers. Elizabeth, until she got sick, was also, would also churn butter to sell to the neighbors along with the milk. There were no milk bottles until the turn of the century, so they delivered the milk in milk cans and then would pour into a customer's pan how much milk they needed. John R. loved raising cows and earlier had teamed up with his friend Wilfred Woodruff to start the Deseret Agricultural and Manufacturing Society. This grew into the Territorial Fair and later the State Fair, and for years John R. was the director. He became known as father of the Utah State Fair and worked hard to put on great fairs each year. John R. became known as one of the most brilliant financial minds in the American West and contributed his talents to dozens of corporate boards. The many businesses he helped with include Salt Lake City's electric light and streetcar system, sugar companies, seven different banks, salt air, coal mines, the Utah Eastern Railroad, beneficial life insurance, ZCMI, Dane's Jewelry, and more. His net worth when he died was nearly $5 million in today's dollars. As his reputation for financial ability grew among the church leaders, he was called to become a general authority in 1887. For 14 years, he served in the presiding bishopric, which are the leaders in the church in charge of collecting tithing, constructing buildings, and administering programs to assist the poor. Now, the U.S. government cracked down on church leaders because of polygamy was called the raid and resulted in some of the leaders in prison and others in hiding. With only one wife at this stage of his life, Ellen, Bishop Winder was sometimes the only presiding bishopric member on the stand at general conferences. Poplar Farm, conveniently located several miles south of the city, was a frequent asylum for John Taylor, who used it as a temporary church headquarters at times. During the dark days of persecution, it was my pleasure to assist in shielding the prophet when pursued by his enemies, Winder later wrote. President Taylor later died in hiding in Kaysville and was succeeded by Wilfred Woodruff. And this is Bishop Winder's letterhead in the 1890s, with Poplar Farm on it. One morning during the dark days of persecution, related Bishop Winder, I met President Woodruff and asked him how he was feeling. Pretty well, he said, only I did not get much rest during the past night. I was wrestling with the Lord all night. Handing me some sheets of paper, he said, and this is the result of my wrestling. The prophet then asked John R. Winder, Charles W. Penrose, and George Reynolds to review and edit the manuscript of the vision and arrange it for publishing. It was the manifesto which announced the end of polygamy. 
It took 39 years to complete the outside of the Salt Lake Temple. But could the inside be finished in just one year from the April 6, 1892 capstone ceremony shown here? President Wilford Woodruff believed it could be and called Bishop John R. Winder to oversee finishing the temple. James E. Talmadge, a University of Utah professor at the time, said, under his efficient supervision, work on the interior of the temple progressed at a rate that surprised even the workers. John R. said of the time, I had heard that some of the brethren at work here said it could not be done, so I called them together in that room. There were 250 men. I was standing in there talking to them and telling them that if there was a man among them that felt that this work could not be accomplished, let him please get his pay and go to work somewhere else. I did not know that President Woodruff was in the house, but it appears that he stood right behind a curtain that was up there and heard what I said. And throwing aside the curtain said, that's right, the work has got to be done. And if there is anybody here that thinks it can't be done, let him leave. When the project was running short of funds, John R. convinced four of his wealthy friends to each kick in $1,500, a lot of money back then, to each sponsor a stained glass window. The window John R. personally sponsored was of the first vision and placed in the Holy of Holies where it remains today. In fact, if, once the Salt Lake Temple is restored, sometimes you can get the workers to let you in, not the Holy of Holies, but kind of the back room behind it, and you can see the back side of it, which I've done a couple times. So there's something to look forward to maybe beyond the open house. Bishop Winder and his crews literally worked to the last minute, but the temple was done by the April 6, 1893 goal. At the dedication of the temple, President Joseph F. Smith remarked that no other person could there be more praise and credit attached than to John R. Winder for his faith and indomitable will in pressing forward this work. Lorenzo Snow was called as the first temple president and John R. as his first assistant. Years later, in recognition of all of his work with the temple, a life-size bronze bust was commissioned and done by the famed sculptor Mahan Rai Young and placed in the temple celestial room. Eventually, it was moved to storage, and in 1968, David O. McKay gave it to the family. Phil Winder's widow Madeline has it today, and their son Brent Winder brought it to tonight's celebration. So be sure to get a birthday selfie with the bronze of John R. out there before you leave. No, oh, I skipped a slide. There we go. In the house of the Lord, we are nearer heaven than in any other place. He said, President Winder loved the temple and performed the weddings for more couples in the Salt Lake Temple's first 15 years than anyone. He served there nearly daily the rest of his life. Let's see, I'm out of order. Did we do this one? Yes, how about this one? How about this one? No, okay. Well, there's the bronze bust I just talked about. And that's the celestial room. There's a picture of Brigham Young hanging on the wall. You don't have that there anymore either. Okay, here we go. By the time of the temple dedication, John R. had been a widower for a year. He was smitten by a young temple worker from New Mexico who, despite their 48-year age gap, was greatly impressed with him. Rye, as she was nicknamed, was an exciting addition to the Winder family. The family adored her, although Will was surprised to come home from his mission and see that his father had married someone younger than himself. She would always sneak treats to the grandkids and would even engage the kids in lively card games that her pious husband disapproved of. So when they would see, her, when they would see his carriage pull up at night after church meetings, they would quickly scoop the cards into her apron and pretend to be praying. John would peek in at the sight and smile approvingly and let them keep praying. Here's the front page of the Salt Lake Tribune when Joseph S. Smith became the prophet and organized the new first presidency. When he was praying about whom to select as his first counselor, it was a time when the church was struggling to get back on its feet financially and to buoy the confidence of the members and the public. When Anthon Lund, who ended up being second counselor, learned of John R.'s call, he said to President Smith, I thought he would, be, he would help to continue the confidence of the people in money matters. It was true, and tithing donations continued to increase dramatically while President Winder was in the first presidency, resulting in the church becoming debt-free at last in 1907. When the call to John R. came, there was initial surprise because he was not one of the apostles. Remember, he had just been the presiding bishopric and never an apostle. 
This hadn't been done since 1856 when Brigham Young called Daniel H. Wells as a counselor. President Joseph F. Smith sprung upon this people one of the greatest surprises they ever had, said George Taylor, but it was met with the heartiest response of anything I think that was ever presented to this people. My call to the presidency was a great shock to me, but I have assurance that it was the will of the Lord, said President Winder. I think we could get along nicely, congenially, happily, and united together, said President Smith, and they did. The apostles President Winder served with included Brigham Young Jr., Apostle and U.S. Senator Reed Smoot, future prophet Heber J. Grant, John Henry Smith, Charles W. Penrose, future prophet David O. McKay, future prophet George Albert Smith, and Orson F. Whitney, who wrote the poem that Chris read earlier. The first presidency's office back then was in the little building between the Lion House and the Beehive House. That was the church office building at the time. He was a wise counselor, a man of clear judgment, said President Lund. If any man loved him more than I do, I say God bless that man, said President Smith. Uh, Joseph F. Smith was 63 years old when he became the prophet. Anthony H. Lund from Denmark was 57. And John R. the Englishman was 79, which was pretty old fact then when he was called. But active and energetic, Brother Winder seemed to be the youngest of the three, said Brother President Lund. This was a busy first presidency. As mentioned, they helped the church get out of debt. They issued the proclamation on the origin of man. They starred the Hotel Utah. The Joseph Smith Birthplace Monument was dedicated. They bought church history sites like Carthage Jail, the Sacred Grove, and sites in Missouri. They built the first Temple Square Visitor Center, and they launched the Children's Friend magazine. Missionary work opened up in Japan for the first time. It reopened in Mexico and South America, or excuse me, South Africa under their direction. They changed the name of Brigham Young Academy to Brigham Young University. And at the time, John R. said, they better not get any more money because of this. They welcomed President Theodore Roosevelt to the tabernacle. They started adult Sunday school classes, for good and for bad. They defended Reed Smoot in Congress, and they called James E. Talmadge, a future apostle, to write Jesus the Christ. John R. ran the church when President Smith traveled to Hawaii, Europe, and the East Coast. But they left President Lund in charge when John R. and Aunt Rye accompanied the Smiths and others on an Oregon trip. They were good friends with Charles Nibley and his family. I was told by my mother that President Winder was unlike any of the other church leaders of his day. He was in a class by himself, a singular man, not like everyone else, not by a long shot. And that was told to me by Hugh Nibley, or Hugh Winder Nibley, as his middle name is. He was born the exact day John R. died, and the Nibley family thought so highly of John R., they named him in his honor. In fact, when his mother was pregnant with him, she was having a hard pregnancy, and was in the t- temple, and President Winder was there, and called and took her aside and gave her a blessing. And Hugh Nibley told me, in that blessing, he prophesied, exactly what would happen in my life. And I said, what did he say? And Hugh Nibley told me, I can't tell you. The only one who knows is me and my mother, and it's going to go that way to my grave. But he was pretty amazing, and I'm honored to have the middle name Winder. He spoke in general conference, President Winder, and he said things like this. Every day that I live, I have renewed assurances that this is the work of the Lord, and that Joseph Smith is a prophet of the Most High God. This testimony gives me joy and strength and satisfaction. Another time he said, The nearer I live to the Lord, the more strength he gives me, and my faith in his promises is increased. I always like this one. My life has been a very busy one, a fact to which I owe much of my longevity and present good health and spirits. It is far better to wear out than to rust out. Those who work will outlive those who shirk. In his patriarchal blessing as a young convert in 1856, he was told that he would be placed as a father at the head of a numerous posterity, which will be given thee. This prophecy has been fulfilled by his 23 children, 107 grandchildren, nearly 500 great-grandchildren, and all of us. John R.'s grandkids were a little fearful of their grandfather's stern old world demeanor. He was frugal at times to a fault, and the grandsons would work extra hard when his carriage would roll through or at least hold still 
they were playing in a tree, or he'd give them a flick from his whip as he passed by. But Grandfather Winder also had a tender side. Mary Winder Johnson remembers seeing him as a young girl and said, although he was almost 85 years old, he stood so very straight. He looked so spotlessly clean. His white hair and beard seemed a shining contrast to his dark clothes. His eyes twinkled and he gave a merry smile. This is the last known photograph of the man. Shortly before his death, he wrote in his daughter Lizzie's autograph book a message that can pertain not only to her but all of us. Remain true to the covenants which you have made or may make hereafter. Be steadfast in the truth. Enduring faithful to the end is the most earnest admonition and desire of your father. This is the Winder home where John R. Winder died of pneumonia, March 27, 1910, at age 89. It was immediately west of Temple Square on West Temple, where the Church Family History Library is today. On his deathbed, John R. exclaimed, I desire above all other things in the world that my posterity, down to the last generation, may prove faithful and true to the work of God in the earth. It was big news when President Winder passed away, and Mormon and Gentile alike noted that he, for many decades he was a Utah institution and a giant pillar in Zion had fallen. Here's the front page of the Deseret News when he died. Thousands gathered at the tabernacle on Temple Square for his funeral. These are some fun shots from that event. In the opening prayer at that funeral, Joseph Taylor prayed, We have heard him speak many times, Father, manifesting great anxiety concerning the future of his family. May they be as faithful, as honorable, as pure as their ancestor, their father, their head, their patriarch. John R.'s portrait hung with an American flag on the organ pipes for the funeral. His empty seat was on the prophet's right hand, and the decorations and family outfits were all white instead of black, because John R. had instructed them that way because he wanted no bleak mourning at his death. One of the speakers, his friend Bishop George Romney, said, I feel I have lost one of my very best friends on earth. I know Brother Winder was one of the best men that ever lived. Utah's first governor was a dear friend and spoke, Governor Heber M. Wells, who praised John R.'s perfectly wonderful industry and untiring energy. There were 70 carriages that then went from Temple Square to the Salt Lake City Cemetery with 12 of his grandsons as pallbearers and honor guard. The whole city lined the streets to bid President Winder farewell, and 2,000 of them attended the graveside service. John R. was later joined by other family members in the family plots of the city cemetery, including Aunt Rye in 1949. This simple headstone there marks the final resting place of John Rex Winder, born exactly 200 years ago this weekend. And in the general conference after he died, the April conference, President Joseph F. Smith spoke, and he paused at the end and said, My brethren and sisters, I felt that I might at least say a few words with reference to President Winder, who recently passed away after a long illness, as I desired to at least show my love and my regard for him and the deep regret that I feel in my heart because of the deprivation that I have suffered by his death. The Lord bless his widow, and this is a blessing from the prophet. The Lord bless his widow and his children and his children's children to the latest generation. And may there never come a time when President John R. Winder shall not have both sons and daughters to represent him before the altar of truth and righteousness in the house of God. This is my prayer. And I had my testimony to the prophets and to our good ancestor, John R. Winder, and the hope that this extended Winder family can continue to serve God and to serve our community and to serve each other for many, many generations to come. And may we carry that legacy forward in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's see. Closing song and prayer, and then a photo and then treats.
Dear Heavenly Father, please bless that we can uh, have a good rest of our evening tonight and that we can uh, arrive at our home safely. And uh, we're so thankful, Heavenly Father, that we uh, had the opportunity to meet here tonight to celebrate the life of John Rex Winder. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.